Hopefully, hi. Oh, yeah, we were having a few troubles with this, but a bit, a bit echoey. But if you could turn down some monitors, that would be really helpful. So I think, oh, lovely, lovely. Um, really nice to see you all, and um, some visitors with us. Really, you know, it's great that you could be with us, even if it's just for today. You're very, very welcome. Um, I'm going to be doing something slightly different today. Apologies if you're, this is a one-time visitor, but we, we established a church vision. I'm still quite echoey here. Um, yeah. Right, in George Whitfield and um, Wesley's day, you didn't need PA, did you? But uh, there we go, it's a bit more complex these days. Um, we have, uh, about a year ago, we set a, a church vision um, and a three-point vision. I'm sure some of you can remember it, many of you won't. But over the next year, we're going to be revisiting this vision statement that we've made um, just to sort of get it into our DNA. So the next six weeks, we're going to be looking at the word hope because that's one of the things we want this church family to be full of and to communicate. Um, about 700 years before uh, Jesus was born, a young man called Isaiah had a vision. He didn't have glasses, by the way. This is just pictorial. Um, it was too early for glasses. But Isaiah, in, in the Old Testament, he had an incredible vision of God, and he wrote it down, 66 chapters worth. It's quite heavy going in some points. It, it talks about the character of God, who God is, how you and I should relate to God, what God thinks about certain good things and not good things. Um, it's a challenging book to read. But throughout the book, there's an amazing character that weaves throughout this book of Isaiah, a, a mysterious character, described several times. Um, and we know that the name, the Messiah. Uh, in the book of uh, Isaiah, given different names, Emmanuel, God with us, the son of David. He's described as a king who's also a servant. One who's going to bring justice to the nations. And yet a king who's going to suffer. This mysterious person weaves their way throughout Isaiah. And at one point in the Isaiah's prophecy, uh, this person speaks. And I think they're some of the most powerful words in Scripture. And those of you that were watching the memorial service in London on Friday evening, you might have noticed that the Old Testament reading was this reading. And I'm going to read it to you. I find it very, very moving. This is the Messiah setting out his mandate. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. And they will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. They will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. Now understand that this was written 700 years before Jesus was alive. And they, maybe, could you play the video? Fast forward 700 years and see what happens. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues and everyone praised him. 
He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. I find that deeply moving. That was Jesus setting out his mandate. He was saying, I am the long-awaited Messiah. I am the one that the nation of Israel has been waiting for for hundreds of years. I am the one who's going to comfort those who mourn, who's going to bring sight to the blind. Um, I'm the one who's going to release the prisoners. And some, when I hear that, something in me wells up because I say Jesus is making some astounding uh, declarations here. I think we don't get the, the weight of what he was saying because the people that were listening to him certainly did, because they wanted to kill him, because they said, you, a mere man. This was his hometown. This was Nazareth, where he'd grown up. He said, are you mad? You blasphemer. You're saying that you're God. Um, a very, very powerful. It's a pivotal moment in, in history. As Joe said earlier on, we're going through a pivotal moment in our nation's history. But this was a pivotal moment in uh, our existence. God in human form on planet Earth. And as I said less, yesterday, um, last year, we announced our vision statement. And I hope that it reflects much of what Jesus was expressing there. Because the amazing thing about Jesus is that he came, he demonstrated a life of love and power, but he also wanted his followers to do the same, to follow in his footsteps. So I'm just going to go over these three points very briefly, as a, just to set the foundations for the next six weeks, where we're going to focus on hope and the importance of hope in our lives and in this church. And what I've said... I don't want to steal Jo's thunder because she's going to be speaking on it next week. But um, we want to be a welcoming church where people can get to know God and each other better. A safe place to start a journey of following Jesus, make friends, and discover hope for the future. Uh, we've already heard about our wonderful Queen. Um, and this was one of her quotes from, I think it was from 2002, her Christmas message. I draw strength from the message of hope in the Christian gospel. As we read the New Testament, something in us should ignite. Um, and it certainly did for our lovely queen. But we want that hope to be firstly for people who don't know Jesus. I'd love it as if people come into this place when we're worshipping on a Sunday, that people's spirits lift. When they meet you and your friends out for a coffee during the week in town, there are 16 coffee shops in Henley. None of them are as good as our coffee shop, obviously. But, you, you, you know, there are other coffee shops available. Um, but if you're meeting your friends, I would love it for something of hope to rise up in their hearts. Hen Henley is an affluent town. It's a beautiful town. But there is a thin veneer of affluence. Because as those of you that work for Nomad and those of you that were part of this church know, there's a huge amount of pain 
and grief and suffering, in, even in this little affluent community. You know, the, the, the biggest killer of under 35s in this country is suicide. And you think, oh God, how can it be? We're, we're born into such a privileged age. How can it be that these young people are taking their lives? You know, I've taken the funeral of a young man who took his own life, and it's the worst thing when you see his friends turning up. You know, how can it be when our wonderful young people are suffering with their mental health? And, um, you know, climate change, inflation, family breakdown. You know, there's lots for people to be worrying about. Well, you know, one of my heroes is David Attenborough. When I was, you know, in the 60s, watching him on telly, I always wanted to be David Attenborough. The trouble is with David Attenborough is when I see him on the telly, and I watch him a fair bit, I don't feel a sense of hope. I feel a sense of overwhelming gloom. You know, the world is going to be destroyed, and, you know, obviously we've got to do something about it. But I want hope. Um, and there we have the Queen drawing strength from the gospel. We're a culture in the need of, need of hope. Uh, yesterday, there was an amazing event here. Um, it is from the, you know, the sublime to the ridiculous, actually, or the ridiculous to the sublime. We had a wonderful day um, with Hussein and Shelley leading the Recovery Cafe and a great team of people. I know they would say it's not just them, but it was for people who were sort of in recovery from various addictions. And we had a guy, um, an amazing man, I've he heard him a couple of times now. He's a session musician uh, called Phil, Phil Spaulding. He played with Elton John and Mick Jagger and um, even on that amazing song, I'm Too Sexy For My Shirt. <laughs> Some of you will remember that. Sorry to mention that in church, but you know. <laughs> yeah. In fact, this is my best shirt. It's a Versace shirt. Did you know? It is, it's true. I got it from a Henley charity shop. <laughs> Henley charity shops are really good, you know, Versace shirt. Anyway, I am too sexy for my shirt. Um, but the, where am I going with this? Um, he, this guy, Phil, is a friend of Hussein's. Um, he told us his story, and it's a story of incredible gifting. And he reminded us that people that are gifted need to take responsibility for that gifting. And he charted his history, amazing gifting, incredible wealth, incredible mixing with the stars and celebrity. But he got into drugs, and there's a lot of history behind that. Um, and he, he talked to us about his broken life. Um, it was hilarious, but tragic. Um, but the, you know, the moment that made it for me of the day Hit right at the end of his set, but I had to go a bit early. At the end, he was playing a romantic song. And it was, you know, not a heavy rock song. He was playing a romantic song. And, and he turned, and he looked there, and he said, it's my wife. And he, because he, his history had been a long and challenging one, but he's, he's in a new relationship, and his wife is his rock, and she came in during this. It was, it was like it was scripted in a movie. Um, he was playing, da, da, da. And then she came in, and they had a big hug, and we all collapsed in tears. And, but there was a sense of a broken man who was being transformed. And that hope rose. You know, well, it certainly did in me. It was a, a beautiful moment. God is here. Yeah, I don't, in his talk, he didn't mention God at all. But... It was very, very powerful. God is a God of hope for people that don't believe in him. And we want that to be here. Secondly, for those of you that are believers here this morning, we want you to have your hope restored and renewed again and again. Just like you're, you know, if you're in a marriage, like your marriage is, a service of hope. You know, each one of us are responsible for the hope in our hearts. If we're a Christian today, you are responsible for your walk with God. We need to maintain that hope. That's why in the Bible it talks quite a lot. Um, one of, another favorite scripture, finally, whatever is true, whatever is noble, what's right, whatever is pure, what's lovely, whatever is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. And as we do that, it restores hope.
in our life. Um, testimonies are so important. We want, we're looking forward to being a church full of testimony where we say, God is doing good things in my life. Big things, little things. Um, but I've had enough. I've talked enough about hope because we're going to do that a lot more later on. Opportunity. We want to be a church where we can all play our part, grow in love for God and each other, and where there's space and encouragement to grow in the gifts God has given each one of us. I love that Isaiah chapter where, you know, the captives are free. The blind receive their sight. And when something like that happens, new horizons appear. You have new opportunities. Um, it, Paul says this, let's not get weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we'll reap a harvest if we don't give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let's do good to all people, especially those who belong to the family of believers. I think the Queen has been such an example of doing good and spreading kindness to others. You know, as I looked out, you know, all the politicians gathered. And you, you know, we, we need to keep praying for our politicians. But, and Chris would know more than most. It's a hotbed of challenging situations. And, and we've got to be there to spread a bit more kindness into our political system. It's very adversarial. <laughs> um, we need more kindness. Um, we have an excellent reputation in this town. We are so privileged as a church to have Nomad as part of us, to have the Family Center as part of us, because it just, you know, these things shine out into people's lives. I, some, I told some of you, I had a lovely little chat with a guy on Dad's Breakfast a couple of Saturdays ago, and he said, you know, I really enjoy coming to Dad's Breakfast, but do you know what? My wife enjoys it even more. <laughs> Because he takes his little child and gives her a couple of hours off in the middle of a really busy day or a busy week or busy life. Um, the, we do make a difference in this town. We are privileged. And the, and the Nomad team here, you make a, such a difference in people's lives. We are blessing the community. But I do want to say today, there is more. There is more. We are a church. We are a church full of believers. We believe in a strong, powerful, loving God. So we don't want people just to be introduced to us and our loveliness and our cafe and how wonderful we are. We want people to meet Jesus. That, for me, that is the bottom line because I can only do so much and I can make someone's life a bit happier. But Jesus can transform people's lives. So we have opportunity to introduce people to the living God and the hope there is. We have opportunity to grow in God. It's really exciting. I know Sarah's, Sarah's group are doing a bit of KST, um, a King's School of Theology course coming up online. And there, you know, there's a group of us in, in the church that are really wanting to grapple a bit more with how we read the scripture and, you know, how we, um, and that's great. Each one of us can do that. Um, you know, last week, Joe talked about prayer times. You know, we, we want to raise the level of prayer in the church. And do come and have a, let us know. If you think, yeah, I'd really like to start or get involved in an early morning prayer meeting in here before people go off to work, let us know. We'd love to do that. You know, we can grab some breakfast and just pray for an hour one, one morning a week. But um, come and tell us, talk to us. You know, some of our older saints in the church have been faithful over decades. I remember in the early 1980s when Pearl and Irene used to serve in the day spring faithfully, day in, day out. Um, some of those more senior saints are handing the baton on. They can't perhaps do as much physically as they once did. But they are praying for us and all that we do. But, you know, we need to take their place. Um, uh, they're an inspiration for that. And just as I uh, think, I had a phone call last night from a gentleman called Steve. 
his wife called Pat. They live in Highlands Farm. And they're an old couple who've moved into Henley in the last few months to be with their daughter. They are, they've got real mobility problems. She's just had a cataract operation. She cannot see this morning. She can see nothing. And he phoned me up and said, would you pray? Please pray. And I said, we will pray. So if, if you um, just, just pray. This, it's Pat and Steve Baldwin in Highlands Farm, just up uh, close to where, um, oh, in fact, in where Peter and uh, Elizabeth live. So, Father, I want to pray that you would open the eyes of the blind. That's what you promised to do, Lord Jesus, and you did it time and time again. So I want to speak healing and release to Pat's eyes in the name of Jesus. Release from darkness and recovery of sight in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining me in that. That's great. Um, so we have opportunity to pray, to, to grow in God. Uh, we wanted to talk about discipleship in the church. We don't want people just chogging along for 20 years, coming along, singing some songs, and then going on. We want people to get to know Jesus better. Um, I want to know Christ and the power of his salvation. I want to know him, the uh, power of his resurrection. Um, so if you want to grow in, in Jesus and would like a one-on-one -on -one time with someone, if you want some discipleship support, if you, if you want to be part of a group that says, yeah, I want to really get to grips with my faith, it's a, a new season, come and have a word with us, please, because we're not going to put on things that people don't want to do. Um, and this is not pastoral care. This is for people who want to grow in Jesus. Um, so come and have a word with us. Opportunities to serve. Um, we're always, you know, we've got some wonderful people in this church. You know, this is a wonderful church, full of amazing people doing amazing things. There's always more opportunity. If you've got some spare time on a Sunday morning or during the week and you want to um, help us out with some things, do come and have a word. And that's practical things, just getting our hands dirty keeping the show on the road. We really appreciate people's help. Um, and our vision statement, as we've talked about hope and opportunity, it helps us to keep focused. Because a, a little church in a small market town can do all sorts of things, and we can stretch ourselves so thin that we are no earthly good to anybody, and we all burn out. Um, we've, someone talked to us a couple of weeks ago about this, another scripture from Isaiah 54. Uh, enlarge the place of your tent. Stretch your tent curtains wide. Don't hold back. Lengthen your cords. Strengthen your stakes. And they said to us, some people are lengtheners, and some people are strengtheners. Some people are out there pioneering new things, doing all sorts of things. Other people are putting the stakes in so that the work is sustainable and will be long-lasting. And we've got to get a really good balance to that. And that's one of the reasons why we were going to do a, a social prescribing service in the church uh, as part of the church building, working with a local GP centre. Um, and we were really excited about it. But as the process went through, on, we realized we were going to overstretch ourselves, and we would probably lead to burnout in some people. And we think, actually, we can provide a loving venue for all sorts of events and activities, but someone else can do the hands-on work as a social prescriber. And so that helped us, having a little vision um, to, to do that. So that was, we've had hope, we've had opportunity, and we've had transformation. We want to be a passionate church where we're transformed by God's love and power and help to transform the lives of people in our community and beyond. Jesus' job, he came to transform humanity. He came to transform the earth, actually, and to put into plan God's purposes um, he came to move us from the kingdom of darkness to light, to destroy the works of the evil one. 
And transformation starts with you and I. Uh, I've said it before. I, I love, there was a famous writer, philosopher, theologian called G.K. Chesterton. He also wrote the Father, Father Brown? Father Brown books and detectives. He was amazing in the early part of the 20th century. There was a, a series of letters, letter writing in one of the, the big national newspapers. I think it was the Times. And it, it was headed up, what's wrong with the world? So people would write in and say, well, this is wrong with the world. It's the politicians. It's the church. It's this. This is wrong. And he wrote in a letter saying, dear sir, I am yours sincerely, G.K. Chesterton. And I thought, there's a man that knew the issue. The problem with the world starts with us. Selfishness, uh, independence, etc., etc. It starts in us. And when asked what was the most important command, Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength. And he did add, and the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. But it, there's lots of debate around that. But increasingly, I've felt, obviously, we are called to love our neighbor. But we need the strength of God to be able to do that. We need to be people full of the love of God, loving him with all our hearts. And then we will love our neighbor properly. So let's get in place the first one before we overstretch ourselves with the second. Um, transformation, I love in this Isaiah 61 passage because there's a phrase, the oaks of righteousness. And Jesus, he talks about really early on, he talks about, um, you know, I'm going to open the eyes of the blind, I'm going to set the captives free, it's all going to be wonderful. And then... It talks about oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord. They're going to rebuild the ancient ruins. They're going to be people that restore the places long devastated. And that's what we want our church to be. A place where people are transformed by the love of God and start to work out their lives in helping others. And I saw it so powerfully yesterday uh, in what Hussein and Shelley were doing. They're, we're broken people. We're ordinary people. We're nothing special. And I saw that so clearly yesterday. But the, the transformation that was taking in place in people's lives was deeply, deeply moving. We are called as a church to rebuild broken down walls. And don't, um, uh, what's the word? Um, what is the word? Don't, don't cut yourself off. No, no, don't, uh, I can't, I can't. don't relegate yourself um, if you think I'm not sorted yet because God loves to use broken pots because um, there's treasure inside each one of us. Our goal as a church is transformation, but we're learning to love one another through the process, which can sometimes be painful because <laughs> we're all so different. And we're called to be a church full of God's love, uncompromising devotion to Jesus and his teaching, but full of love. You know, Jesus had some of the most high moral standards that have ever been written about in human history. And in, in a sense, he should have been like the Taliban. You know, he was a, a moral zealot in what is teaching. High standards, calling us to love our enemies, give generously, uh, be fa totally faithful. You know, he called us high bar. And yet he loved the broken. He spent time with people that were fragile. Uh, and as a church, in the coming years, we have big battles to face. Because there's one thing showing love to everybody and saying we are motivated by, motivated by the love of God. But there's another thing, staying devoted to the teaching of Scripture. And we are in a cultural battle at the moment. 
The church could be very isolated in coming decades as we hold to biblical principles. And we need all the wisdom and grace of God to follow, to follow Jesus' footsteps. But let's be a people that aim for transformation personally, aim for a transformation culturally in our local community and internationally. Some wonderful things happening out of this church with refugees, with CAP, um, in Malawi, with our friends in, in Pakistan, as Joe's been praying, they run this TV um, station. They're not a, ref, you know, they're not a um, refugee and a um, relief organization, but they're already producing uh, TV programs for children to improve their hygiene and safety around water and things like that. Lots of things happening. We want to be a church that is full of transformation. So I'm just coming into land now. Um, there's our beautiful town, isn't it? We do live in an incredibly beautiful town. I mean, all the visitors that come here say, Henley's really nice, isn't it? Even our daughter thinks that Henley's quite nice now. <laughs> you know, it has some benefits over Reading. Not many, but you know, there are one or two. Look at that. What a beautiful place. We're such a privileged people. But this all comes back to Jesus. He's the one who stood up in the synagogue and said, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me. He has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. And we want to be a church that keeps coming back time and time again to Jesus. He said, freely you have received. Freely give. We've received so much from God. We need a church to be a church full of giving, giving hope, giving opportunity, and seeing transformation take place. And all of us need to be on board. Uh, earlier in the week, Lisa gave a little prophetic word. I think it was before the Queen had died. Yeah, it was, it was about us being a royal family. If you're a believer in Jesus today, you're part of a royal family. You know, you're a child of God. And it's time to raise our perspective. We all can do something different as part of the great, great picture that God wants to paint in this town and community. We've all got a part to play. And uh, I just want to finish by just praying for us. And then maybe Tanya can, can lead in a song. Yeah. So should we stand? Those of you who can stand.